Thank you, thank you, Marion, uh, for the very nice words. Uh, thank you all for coming on this really cold, cold, almost Martian temperature day in New York. Uh, and uh, thank you to Marilyn and Jim Simons for uh, starting something which I will try to describe to you here is a new wave in uh, an old, solving an old question. The old question uh, humankind has always asked itself about uh, where we come from. Uh, are we alone in this big place that we live in, the universe? It is uh, the Simon's collaboration on the origins of life, which uh, just started uh, this past year. And a lot of what I'm going to uh, tell you about today is uh, my perspective, which is the perspective of the astronomer, uh, about uh, this new wave of um, research uh, that is trying to answer this old question, or those old questions. And so uh, let's start. One way to ask the question from an astronomer's perspective is, is there life on other planets beyond Earth? And uh, that's kind of an easy question, which has been asked uh, for a long uh, time by people ever since 450 or so years ago. Um, it became clear that the Earth is just one of the planets and other stars may have planets. Uh, another way to ask the same question is, are we alone? Um, is there life on other planets? If there isn't, uh, then we are the only ones in this universe. That's a possibility. Um, people have uh, talked about this in waves over the past couple of centuries. It started with uh, Fontenelle in the 18th century, then it went through Flammarion in the 19th century. Then in the 20th century, especially during the 60s, uh, there was another resurgence of interest in this uh, topic. Um, there is one of the books on that beyond the observatory. You can see the 60s cover. Um, Carol Sagan, uh, Harlow Shapley in this case. And a lot of these waves of discussing the issue of uh, life beyond Earth, um, uh, alien life, if you will, was mostly in the popular literature. So uh, the authors that I mentioned to you were scientists, but uh, these treatises, which uh, uh, particularly discuss the existence of life beyond Earth, were mostly popular. What is different today in the past couple of years um, is that for the first time you see a lot of publications in the technical science literature. So I think for the first time in the history of humankind we have a chance to answer this question. There is a lot of excitement and um, actual work going on uh, to try and answer this question now. And maybe for the first time in these past few centuries, it's not going to be just the popular books, but you're going to get some real interesting answers. And um, my perspective in that comes from the uh, combination of research which is happening on two different fronts. One of them is uh, the field which I come from, which is the field of exoplanets, the discovery and study of planets around other stars, which is an astronomical perspective. And the other one is the biological, biochemical, or chemistry perspective, which brings closer to us uh, uh, some basic understanding of the nature of the phenomenon we call life, and how we could be looking for signatures of that on other planets. So let's start with the first per, uh, part of that which is the astronomical perspective. Um, the field of exoplanets and the discovery of exoplanets has gone really uh, beyond our expectations in the last few years, mostly thanks to space telescopes, big projects which were conceived 15, even longer than 15 years ago, and finally started working in the past four or five years. In particular, the NASA Kepler mission uh, which essentially was completed in the past year, and which last year uh, our team um, announced a couple of very interesting systems, one of which is Kepler-62. And here we asked an artist to represent as close as possible to, uh, the system of five planets, Kepler-62, in a way in which we of course don't observe it, but in which it can be shown to a general audience uh, uh, like today. 
So the system uh, has a star similar to the sun, slightly smaller, with three of the planets being very close to the star. You can see in actual scale, these are the three orbits. And then number four and number five, the two outside planets, are quite interesting. They are slightly bigger than the Earth. One of them is uh, where Venus is about in our solar system. So it's probably warmer and quite steamy in terms of surface conditions. Number five, the outside one of the five, is where Mars is approximately in our solar system in terms of surf surf surface temperature expectations for it. And again, slightly bigger than the Earth. Both of these planets in the system Kepler-62 um, are in the so-called habitable zone. You see the, the artist here has uh, marked it with green color uh, uh, to designate a region which is uh, just at the right distance from the star where it's not too hot, so the water can be liquid on the surface uh, and not just hot vapor. It's not too cold on the outside where, of course, at some point it will get too cold and uh, water will be only frozen if it exists on the surface. So that's typically um, where um, you would consider life similar to life on Earth, which requires uh, water as a solvent to exist. And not surprisingly, in the solar system, um, the Earth is right in the habitable zone, uh, by definition almost. Uh, so Venus is at the inner edge, uh, Mars is near the outer edge. Um, it's, a, it's a good way to, um, to uh, apply statistics when you're dealing with uh, thousands of uh, uh, systems and you want to know how often are planets like the Earth occurring in this range of distances from a typical star. And so that was what we were trying to accomplish that was the major goal of the Kepler mission. And so you see here a, a to scale a comparison between the solar system orbits and the Kepler-62 uh, orbits. You can immediately notice that because the Kepler-62 star is a little bit smaller and uh, produces less energy, it's a bit cooler, the habitable zone is closer to the star. Um, it's simply a matter of uh, where do you get the right temperature, and if the star is smaller, it's closer to the star. Um, that actually is good from a technical point of view of the person who, like me, is trying to discover those planets. It's easier to discover planets which are closer to their star. Uh, just on the very surface of it, if you have to wait for at least one orbital period to confirm that this is a planet, there is signal, uh, it's much easier to wait for eight months than for 12 months. You know, that's kind of part of the reason for this. Now, I want you to also notice the gallery, the rogue gallery of planets here. Uh, in particular, 62 F and T are the two planets which are in the habitable zone of uh, Kepler-62. And they are uh, two scale in terms of their sizes compared to the Earth. They're slightly bigger, but from all we can tell, <coughs> they're not really... Um, uh, much different in their internal composition um, uh, than what we know here in the solar system as the Earth and Venus. Maybe they have a lot more water, uh, but that's also become solid under the high pressure inside the planet. So they're not gas giants made of hydrogen and helium. That's essentially what I'm trying to say here. And uh, in that sense, that similarity uh, made us call them as a bigger family uh, super Earths, so that's where the name of that, uh, the title of the book came from. So it's a new type of planet. It just happens, uh, now we know, it just happens by chance, that in our solar system there is no such planet, which is uh, made of rock or water, rock and water combination, or one or the other, which is slightly bigger than the Earth. Uh, there is no such planet in the solar system. Now we know this is just a matter of coincidence, it just happened so, uh, historical uh, reasons, nothing special, but they're very common in the universe. In the galaxy, we find them around many stars. And as you can see, uh, we usually measure the radius of planets like that pretty accurately, uh, with a few percent accuracy, actually. Um, sometimes even better than a few percent. 
So we know the size quite well. Uh, in some cases, we know the masses, not yet for these two, but uh, we know the masses, so we have the mean density. And you can see here how they compare to the Earth. Of course, uh, the artists had some artistic license here, so <laughs> we don't know what's on the surface yet, but that's where I'm going. That's where we are going with this uh, research. We have to find them first, but as you will see, we can tell a lot more about them. So we find them um, with... Uh, uh, telescopes like Kepler, a space telescope um, uh, orbiting around the Sun, behind the Earth in an orbit and uh, looking at a particular direction in the sky between uh, the constellations of uh, Lyra and uh, Cygnus, Vega and Deneb, and um, looking for transits. Um, um, Kepler was designed um, or funded is the better way for three and a half years we wanted four, then uh, we thought, well, once three and a half years had passed, NASA allowed us to go for another four, two plus two, another four. Unfortunately, two days after the fourth year of the mission, um, one of the um, reaction wheels, or another one of the reaction wheels, which keeps the telescope positioned properly in space, failed, and that was uh, the second out of four, so the telescope right now has only two gyroscopes, two reaction wheels, and it cannot point accurately towards um, the field. So the mission is over. Uh, the data is not completely analyzed yet. It's a lot of data, but we managed to get four years out of it, so the statistics will be good. And what we know so far of the statistics is uh, very encouraging, and in fact, surprisingly so. So I'm going there. Before that, I want to uh, make sure that you understand how Kepler discovers planets, because this is not the only way to discover planets, but it is an important way. It discovers them with the help of eclipses, or we call them transits. That is when the planet passes in front of its star, which of course would not happen for all planetary systems, only for a subset, for about 1 to 2% of all planetary systems there, the orientation will be such that we'll see transits. So you see those uh, periodic dimmings, and it has to be periodic. Uh, just one transit cannot help you confirm a planet, and you will not know the period, which is important for you to uh, understand how far the planet is from the star. But that's how the system works, and you will f uh, see that this is also useful uh, for studying the planets once you discover them. So that's how Kepler discovered a lot of the planets in the past uh, four years and the statistics will come from this particular method of discovering them. And you can see also why we wanted Kepler to stare at all those stars for four years, because we wanted to catch planets which have a period of one year, and to catch them at least three times, coming back and back again, and maybe fourth time, to be sure that they're planets to determine the period accurately, and uh, to be able to study uh, the statistics uh, correctly afterwards. Uh, most of the stars that Kepler studied are like the Sun, but a particular subsection, a very small subsection of them, are very small. We call them uh, red dwarf stars. That's the actual uh, terminology, the technical terminology is to call them red dwarf stars. And so some of them show eclipses, transits, which are due to planets, and some of them are due to some very small planets, like the Earth. These are easy to see with Kepler, what is difficult for Kepler to see is uh, many of those small stars. And not because they're rare, just the opposite, they're actually the most common star in the galaxy, but because they're very faint. Now, remember Kepler 62? Being faint is not bad for the habitable zone. That means that you don't uh, need to have a period of one year to be in the habitable zone. In, in fact, for a planet like this, for a star and planet like this, it will be more like three weeks for an orbital period. That close to the star, you will be in what we would call the habitable zone. So there is a lot of interest in studying planets around those small red dwarf stars. And although it was difficult for Kepler, we have some data from it now, um, because it was difficult to find. But most importantly, people didn't know whether we will find any interesting planets around those small stars. We don't quite yet understand how planets form, and 
it was especially difficult to extrapolate from the case of planetary systems like the solar system with the big star like the sun down to those red dwarfs. And let me show you one example of how uh, unusual and exotic, if you will, such planetary systems may look like. And one particular example is the Kepler object of interest 961, which is a planetary system with three known planets at this point, which um, uh, is comparable not to the solar system, but to the system of the four large moons of Jupiter, the gas giant planet Jupiter in our own solar system. Um, these are to scale. So the star is just slightly bigger in size than Jupiter, but it is a star. Jupiter is a planet because it has no internal sources of energy. It just cools slowly like all planets do with its internal heat still preserved from its formation. Uh, this uh, red dwarf up there is a star because it has just the right amount of mass to heat uh, the interior at high density to a temperature where uh, hy hydrogen undergoes nuclear fusion. And that's why it is a star. It emits light. It will do so for a very long time because it is very thrifty with how it burns its nuclear fuel. Very little at the time, and it uh, could last for many billions of years, almost hundreds of billions of years. But look at its planets. The planets are slightly smaller than the size of the Earth, and there are three of them that we know already. Um, it is quite an unusual planetary system because if you projected the Sun on this scale, it will be too big to fit on the screen. In fact, you will catch just a little bit of it here. That's the sun on this scale, that yellow line. So why is this uh, exciting? And this result is literally from um, the past year. It hasn't been yet um, even 12 months since um, a lot of these results uh, beca became public. The reason this is exciting is because these small stars are the most common star in the galaxy and in the universe in general. And if they have so many of those small planets, and many of them in the habitable zone, then they become the most common habitable planets, planetary systems in the galaxy. And so, in a sense, we've always asked the question, is the Earth a planet which is not common, a unique planet? And somehow, that's why there is life on it. Uh, it appears that the Earth uh, is quite commonplace. Uh, there are a lot of planets like the Earth. What is not common is the star our Earth orbits, which is uh, kind of an interesting twist. Uh, nobody uh, really had expected uh, very much. So it, there is something unusual about the solar system, but it has to do with the star rather than with the planet Earth uh, that we inhabit. So let me then take all these results and show you where we stand in terms of the statistics. So how common are these habitable planets? Well, for those of you who really like, you know, uh, histograms and percentages and numbers, this is actually the current uh, uh, set of numbers from the Kepler team as of November last year. Um, you can see the actual numbers of planetary candidates. These are the uh, numbers above each one of the bars for Earth-sized, super-Earth-sized, Neptune kind of sized planets and bigger ones. The yellow percentages are the difference between what we had determined 10 months earlier in January of 2013 with the Kepler data compared to November. So you can see the largest uh, new additions come in those categories, not in the big planets. So obviously, we managed to catch all the big planets early on, and we are still working on catching in the data or mining out of the data the small ones. <coughs> and particularly, you can already see that this is where the bulk of the planets in the sample are. And this is a representative sample. So this is a sample that we can then extrapolate to the whole galaxy and which is what we want to do. To do. So uh, there are few large planets out there. There are 
a large amount of smaller planets. And the reason actually um, the numbers drop here at Earth size is not because there are fewer of them, as we suspect there are. It is because it's, they're more difficult to find. So this is, as we would say, an incompleteness. So we are complete for those, but here we have to work harder to catch all of them. And so you can see the percentages there. We'll have more to come. You have to remember in the meantime, though, that these are numbers for that particular mission, which uses that particular way to discover planets. And these are only planets which orbit their stars to, say, within the distance between the Sun and the Earth. We do not see the real Jupiters and Saturns, which have periods of 12 years and 30 years. I mean, the mission only lasted for four years, so how would you catch a 30-year planet and have statistics there? So remember that, that this is uh, limited in, in a sense. So it's still early to say, uh, to compare this to the um, solar system and say the solar system is unique or the solar system is mainstream. We don't know that yet very well. Um, and other methods may tell us better of discovering planets how this works. But when it comes to the habitable planets, that already is allowing us to say something about this. And so uh, with the most recent results, um, the, uh, the rough number is now up to a billion and maybe more than a billion of this kind of planets in the galaxy, Milky Way galaxy as a whole. Now this number is going to, is astronomically large, and a lot of people say, wow, this is huge, there's so many planets. But remember, the Milky Way galaxy is also very large. So the fact that we have so many planets uh, on the surface of it doesn't automatically mean that um, this is great, because we have a galaxy here which has uh, 300 billion stars to begin with, and it's a very big place. The distances between individual stars are very large. So that doesn't automatically mean uh, that we should uh, uncork the champagne bottles, but it, in fact it does in this particular case. We anticipated a much smaller number, and now with the M dwarfs being part of the picture, which are very plentiful and relatively close to us, what this number really means, and why it is exciting to me for this talk today, is because it means that we can discover uh, hundreds of them really close to us. And I care about the ones which are close to us, not the ones which are on the other side of the galaxy, because I really want to study them. I want to have an opportunity to explore those planets, not just to know statistically that they are out there. I actually want to get to the real point of my talk here, which is, is there life on other planets? And how do we find out? And so this big number is really uh, uh, something which I would say is transforming that quest, that field, because for the first time we realize that we have now the technology to do that exploration because there are planets in the near vicinity to be discovered that will allow us to do that. And in a sense, um, NASA already realized that, and last spring um, um, it um, approved a project to do exactly this. It's called TESS. It's the follow-up to the Kepler mission. It's also a space telescope, but a different one. It's actually a platform with four small cameras. We, you no longer need a big telescope because you want to discover the nearest planets, the ones which are closest to us. So they're relatively bright stars. The difference is that uh, unlike Kepler, this one is going to scan the entire sky. Kepler was only pointing in one direction because we want to get good statistics. In this case, we don't care about the statistics. We want to catch the individual planets that we want to then study. And because of the large numbers produced by Kepler and the other surveys, uh, tests became feasible. Because now we could promise that we will discover such planets because they're near to us. Uh, five, ten years ago, when we actually had an idea about this follow-up to Kepler, and it didn't get approved, we didn't uh, have such a big number. So it was very uh, tricky to convince people that maybe we'll find ten, maybe we'll find zero. So you spent uh, 
300 million doors and then you find zero, it's not very good. So that's TESS. Um, I have to say though that TESS is not the only way in which we'll discover those nearby planets. TESS is going to do, use the same technique, which is the transiting technique, just like Kepler. And so that limits you to only one, two percent of the planetary systems. So that's not very helpful when you want to get all of the nearest interesting uh, uh, planets and planetary systems to you. And that's why there are other projects, and actually those can be done from the ground, in a sense, cheaper than space telescopes, which are using different techniques, like Doppler Wobble method, which could bring some of those interesting uh, Earth-like planets to us directly to some of the nearby stars without having to wait for four years for TESS to go to space. Actually, Deborah uh, Fisher from Yale is here, who leads one of those projects. So hopefully with TESS and with her project, we'll get to those planets and then uh, get to the real interesting part of, to me, what I want to do here. Okay, once we know the planets, uh, we want to look for signatures of life on them. So the question is, how do you do it if uh, you can't get there? And I, I can promise you that there is no way we'll get there. Uh, 80 light years away <laughs> is farther away than we can get at this point. Well, this question has two parts to it. One of them is technical, and the other one is technical but a little bit more conceptual. It turns out that the first part, which is how do we do it, the technical part, is easy, relatively easy. You do it with the help of biosignature gases. Gases which are produced by the life that you're looking to detect, like cyanobacteria producing oxygen gas, and which disperse in the atmosphere and det detectable in the atmosphere as trace gases. And we know how to do that. In fact, the last 50 years, with the space age in particular, we learned how to do this by detecting trace gases by their signatures in the light, both in the optical and infrared light. Each molecule has a very particular color signature, and that's what we call the remote sensing. Remote sensing, or remote sensing spectroscopy in particular, because we call those color signature spectra, is the way in which uh, from airplanes or uh, satellites, we measure pollution levels, we measure the ozone levels, which uh, is pointing at the particular spectral signatures of ozone. So we use it from space. We use it on the ground all the time, remote sensing on the ground. In particular, uh, uh, our colleagues in Germany uh, use that in order to uh, detect people drinking during the world soccer match, as you can see there. In this case, of course, they were targeting the signatures of alcohol in the spectrum. There is a telescope, and there you see a particularly uh, drunk individual, which is the white <laughs> pixel. But you can also notice that the drunk individual is part of a whole group which is heavily drinking. The other thing is you can see almost everybody is. <laughs> uh, maybe, yes. Anyway. So that's remote sensing for you. So we know how to do this. And of course, this is spectroscopy and imaging at the same time. But you can do just the spectroscopy. You can, uh, if you cannot have a resolution to see the image, which is the case with distant stars and planets, you just do the spectroscopy. And that is good enough because you will know whether those trace gases are present in the atmosphere of those planets. And we already have done this, particularly for transiting planets those that are discovered with transits, but then we can study them. Um, we have two opportunities to measure this. While the planet is in front of the star, you measure uh, the trace gases in transmission. And when it comes, comes to the back, you see the day side of the planet, and then you see it in emission, like that, those drinking bodies and the, the emitting the material. So, so basically, uh, just technically, the reason this works for transiting planets so well is because you have the on-off switch. In all of the exoplanet, planetary uh, um, um, science, the biggest problem for getting anything done or measured is the star. 
the star contributes the bulk of the light and hence the noise in your ability to detect the very weak signal which comes from the, from the planet. So the on-off switch of a transiting planet allows you to uh, subtract the signal from the star and pull out the very weak uh, noisy signal from this planet. So as I said, this already has been used multiple times for bigger planets, not for planets the size of the Earth but also for planets which are super-Earths. Well, at least for one of them, uh, this one in particular, that's a recent work from the group in Chicago, which managed to look uh, very carefully for the signature of water. So remote sensing of water in this case. We had looked for hydrogen, didn't find it, and then the idea was, well, maybe then the atmosphere is quite rich in water vapor, let's try to catch the water vapor. And in this case, I'm not showing you uh, a remote sensing image of the planet. We don't see the planet. We just see a point of light, which is really mostly the light from the star. But then you spread out the colors, and this is the infrared, from 1 micron all the way to 1.7 microns. This is done with the Hubble Space Telescope. And then you plot it as a spectrum. That's what we call spectrum. And those wiggles that you see here would be due to um, uh, water uh, signatures and other molecules, but particularly water, if water was there. And that's a particularly good signature here with the blue line, 100% water. And as you can see, the obser observed points, the black points with the air bars there, show zero. So we, the, there was no detection of water in this super Earth. But you can see that if there was water, we would have been able to detect it. So as a community, we already have the technical capability to do this kind of work. So that's what I wanted you to understand, is that this is not a future we'll get there one day. We already can do that. We just don't have enough of those planets to apply it to. And I can show you the same feature of water in another system is detected, well detected with the a Hubble Space Telescope, so we know how to do this. Um, if you had the, system, the two planets in the habitable zone that I told you before, Kepler 62 E and F, you could do the same kind of uh, work on them, but they're so far away because Kepler observed, for statistical purposes, very distant planets. Uh, but theoretically, at least, we have a prediction of what it would look like, and you would be able to see differences between the two planets, E and F, top and middle, compared to our Earth in the bottom. What is more important is if there was life similar to life on Earth, producing oxygen, like the cyanobacteria, you will see the ozone and oxygen features with the technology which is coming along. And the technology that is coming along is the successor to the Hubble telescope, the James Webb Space Telescope. Here is a, a life-size model uh, of uh, the telescope, which is being built as we speak now. That's in Texas for a show there, but uh, and, um, it's, it looks very futuristic. But in a sense, it's a fairly simple infrared telescope, open design. And what you see here are the shields, the screen shields, to protect it from the sunlight uh, and from the heat from the sun in particular, because in the infrared, that is the source of noise. So this telescope is coming online, meaning in space, in about six years. And that telescope is going to be able to do this kind of work. Not necessarily for 62E and F, because these are really far away but for that kind of planets, and particularly the ones which we hope will be discovered between now and then. And actually at NASA, they did the calculation. Uh, this is coming in 2020. TESS is supposed to fly in 2017. So we, we will have some targets for it by then. And I hope the other surveys are going to have some as well. So that's the plan. And if that was the whole story, we are done. We just have to build the telescopes, we have the remote sensing capabilities, and uh, we can go out and uh, uh, just wait for our colleagues at NASA to launch them. 
but that's, that's where the final challenge is. You see, if you use uh, these telescopes, you know how to detect uh, life, which is a carbon copy, pun intended in this case, of our life on Earth. But the big question to me, and I hope to many of you, is what if life on other planets is not the same as life on Earth? How do we know that? So, it, well, first of all, it may develop differently, which is one way for it to be different. But there is a much deeper uh, fundamental question here, is we only have one example, and we know that that one example has a very particular quite well-defined and limited in certain sense biochemistry. That is the number of molecules, the type of molecules that are used by life on Earth, a very particular subset of the molecules that the whole of chemistry provides for you. So we don't know whether this is the only set that works. Uh, maybe a different set of them will produce interesting viruses and bacteria that will work as well. This is a question that hasn't been studied. And this is the time to do this. And the reason this is the time to do this is because the telescope is coming. And it will be embarrassing to people like me if we have very interesting uh, trace gases in a number of Earth-like planets and we don't know what we are looking at. And so essentially this is the big Part, the second part of that question. Can we do it? Yes, we can technically do it. Do we know what we are doing? I would say no, not yet. So there are three of the multiple ways in which we can do our homework between now and 2020. And I will tell you about three of them because this is the ones that I'm more engaged with. Uh, but I hope and I know that people are trying other ways. So the first one is to say, OK, on Earth, it was mostly cyanobacteria, not the methane-producing uh, kind of bugs, that uh, caused for the main biosignature gas to be uh, produced and detectable, which is oxygen, free oxygen in the atmosphere. That's Earth's biosignature gas. But we know that there are other bacteria out there and other multiple types of microorganisms, as well as plants and animals, that produce a very large list of small molecules, metabolites usually called. Why don't we make a very extensive list and see which one of them are gases, which one of them could be dispersed in the atmosphere and hence be very good biosignature uh, gases for us. And ones which don't have false positives, that is, if a bacteria is producing a lot of carbon dioxide and typical volcanoes on a rocky planet are producing a lot of carbon dioxide, that's not going to be a good biosignature because how would you know whether it's the volcanoes or life? So this is one way to do it. You just make an extensive list and a lot of people are working on that. That, however, already assumes that you are restricted to the same biochemical base that Earth life is. So you have the same kind of genetic molecules, the same kind of metabolic cycles uh, that are uh, known on the Earth, and the same set of proteins and enzymes. Um, another way to do this, and to, which overlaps to some extent with this first approach, would be to try and build those little systems that could produce an accelerated um, uh, string of evolution sequences. What I mean by that is, if you are able to use a molecule like RNA, which is a cousin of the DNA molecule, like a single-stranded DNA, which has the capability to uh, replicate its own uh, genetic material without the use of enzymes, Maybe you can build a very simple um, system, like that of a minimal artificial cell, which would undergo uh, accelerated evolution and will tell you what kind of metabolites might evolve for very simple initial set of uh, 
or tools of biomolecules without the very extensive baggage of genetic information and genetic expressions which are carried by already evolved um, minimal bacteria and microbes that we can study. This is one, I would say, second way in which you can go along uh, trying to discover biosignature gases. There are several um, labs that are trying to work on that already, both in the United States and in England and Germany. And what they are basically doing, on one hand, are trying to understand the pathways, chemical pathways, to um, create molecules similar to RNA in the lab under natural conditions. And on the other hand, understand how they would uh, function inside uh, lipid vesicles, uh, proto-cell membranes, that uh, those bubbles that you see in those pictures here. Um, the combination of the two was something which didn't seem to work for many years. And it is for the first time in the last couple of years that a lot of the steps that are necessary for a system like that to work have slowly be been uncovered. So that will allow you for the, another way to discover those metabolites. There is a third one in which you will go way out and indeed to, for the first time, to a fundamentally different biochemistry, although I would argue slightly trivial in a sense, but different nevertheless. And that is using the fact that most of these biomolecule, bi biomolecules have a symmetry. In other words, they're chiral. Uh, amino acids, which um, polymerize to produce proteins, and uh, nuclear bases which, and sugars, which will give you um, some of the other molecules, come both in left-handed and right-handed versions. And we already know that there is a smoking gun, which is this big piece of rock that is depicted by an artist there, that comes from space um, in the way of carbonaceous meteorites, carbonaceous chondrite meteorites, which already were known for quite a few decades to have organic molecules, uh, a wide array of amino acids and nucleobases that naturally were synthesized on those meteorites. But it is only recently, and literally in the last two years, that it was well established and shown that many of them have a symmetry in the distribution of left-handed versus right-handed uh, um, abundances of those molecules. And interestingly, they're usually left-handed. Whenever the meteoritic material is uh, showing mineralogical evidence for um, humidity and water, being involved during the synthesis of the organic material in that particular part of the meteorite, the prevalence of uh, amino acids which are there to be left-handed by anywhere from a few to 30%, which is quite uh, uh, dramatic given that under natural chemical conditions, uh, you will always get racemic uh, uh, mixtures, meaning it will be always perfectly 50-50% left-handed and right-handed. This, as you well know, is a well-established feature of Earth life. Earth life is entirely left-handed in the amino acids and proteins. And uh, it probably started that way and is very well railroaded in that throughout its evolution. Uh, it may be just a spontaneous symmetry breaking, meaning that it was by chance that it started left-handed and just continued being left-handed. The right-handed version never had any chance. That's what Charles Darwin thought, at least, um, and others. And that seems natural. I mean, if you have equal opportunity to produce both, and physics does not uh, give you any reason at the level of molecules to prefer left-handed to right-handed. But there is something that the basic chemistry of producing those under the conditions of the early solar 
system, the early solar nebula, as it's called, before the planets are there, where these meteorites come from, to prefer a particular excess. Now, this is interesting because we want to understand why it happens. And could it happen on a different planet differently? That is, would a different planet have instead the preference for right-handed, or uh, it will be always left-handed for some reason which we still don't understand. So one way to do that is to synthesize all the basic units of a simple cell, but in the opposite chirality. And while this artificial chemical system was suggested by Tony Foster and George Church quite a few years ago in the normal symmetry, when we started talking about doing uh, opposite symmetry or mirror life uh, example of that, it became clear that this would work even better because it will be a much cleaner experiment. There is no such life and contamination in our labs on this planet. Except there was a big problem with the ribosome, which is a very important part of the puzzle when you have to complete the cycle of uh, replication and um, uh, change in the uh, whole system, which could not be synthesized in the opposite symmetry until very recently. So again, just like with the exoplanets, there is a major breakthrough which occurred two or three years ago when that synthesis was made possible. So for the first time now, you can uh, design, and um, George Church is actively working in that direction, a system which will be right-handed in its proteins. And uh, it will be interesting to see whether we learned anything from comparing it to its left-handed earthly uh, cousins or brothers and sisters. So these are just three of the possible ways in which you could solve uh, the problem which we have now is, are we going to look just for what we know? Or are we going to have a slightly better informed way in looking for biosignature gases that may be outside of the normal box of planet Earth? Um, this is, in a sense, also uh, one of the big drivers to many of the investigators which are part of the new Simons collaboration on the origins of life. And uh, that combination of interdisciplinary research, as Marion pointed out, is uh, what we hope is going to get us ready for uh, 2020 when the James Webb telescope is going to be out in space and uh, starting to observe remotely the first interesting, potentially habitable Earth-like planets out there. We'll be ready to interpret them. And uh, in the meantime, maybe we'll find life on Mars, and that will teach us what uh, a second independent genesis of life is like. And uh, we'll understand something somewhat better what the nature of life is. But I think we are probably as likely to uh, succeed in the bigger uh, uh, search for living planets around other stars as we are on Mars in the next uh, 10 years. So it will be a race. And we will see who finds what first. But in any case, it's a very exciting race. And I hope that I managed to get you at least a glimpse of why uh, so many of us are uh, getting uh, really excited about this now. And we hope to uh, come back and report to you in a few years with uh, something which is uh, really out of this world. Thank you very much. <laughs>